Hi, this is Susan Cowsill here with John on Retrospectives on 3SER KC Radio. That. Let's talk about your trip to Germany. Tell us uh, all about it. Oh, boy. Our trip to Germany was magical um, on many levels and, and you know, and very realistic in, in rock and roll on others. Uh, we were uh, gone for two weeks, and, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people um, in Europe, or at least in Germany, the Continental Drifters, which is a band I, I and Russ had been in for many years, pretty popular in Germany but um, you know I'm doing it solo now and and though there are the drifter fans a lot of people don't know who I am so um, probably every second gig there wasn't a soul in sight <laughs> there'd be like 14 people but but the 14 people were were just you know very attentive audience and, and had a great time and that's just that's just part of the lot when you're when you're kind of starting a new career and in some ways I am you know because yeah. I've never gone solo as Sandy Denny would say um, so there was that aspect of it but you know well, every third night it was packed and the people were just incredibly receptive and it was it was really fun the only problem I was really having was I actually had some bronchitis going on oh no oh yeah so <laughs> I sounded less than a hundred percent myself but I think the song and dance I did, nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and on the on a personal level, it was really wonderful. We had an incredible tour manager um, on this trip, and he was willing to get up a couple of few hours early each day so we could do some sightseeing. And we went to uh, the castle in Wurtburg, which is where uh, Martin Luther uh, translated the New Testament, which is really cool. And we went and spent a day in, oh, God, I hope I'm going to say Strasbourg, France. Yeah, right? yeah. Because we uh, had a day off, so we were about 45 minutes from the border, and I'd never been to France before, so we, we hopped over to France for lunch. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> all in great. all, it was just a, a beautiful trip. So what's the status of uh, international distribution for your record? Uh, status on how is it doing? Yeah, well... Uh, or how does it happen? Well, have you basically got the whole world covered, or um, just um, most of Europe is covered? The, the United States is not. We only it, it's released in Germany on a record named uh, a label named Blue Rose Records, and they have uh, you know I think they've got the UK, they've got Belgium, they've got most of Europe, but I don't think all of it. I mean, it's not out in Japan. It's not you know, and how it's doing. I don't think it's doing fabulously, but um, I'm told the market is, you know, it's 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 kind of like here in the states. The record business is, you know, primarily about mainstream, mm. you know, uh, mainstream rock and roll, Britney, you know, Ashley, you know, you know, that's kind of how it yeah. is here, and, yeah. it, and it seems to be the same there. But. Um, we are we're forging ahead here in the states um, um there's a lot of label interest here and uh, hopefully we're going to um south by southwest which is a music convention here in the state oh, in yes. march are you familiar oh yes we are we, we're quite familiar with it down here yeah um we usually send our own contingent over every year oh sweet you yeah. do do you ever get to go not me no but <laughs> Usually, the, no. usually a whole swag of Australian artists do go over there, so you'll probably run into some while you're there. Okay, well, I'll be looking for them. Um, so we're going heading there in a couple of weeks and um, see what we can rustle up for the United States over there. Fantastic. Let's test your memory a bit. How, how vivid are your Uh-oh. memories <laughs> <laughs> of your childhood and joining the family group at such a young age? You, you were seven, weren't you, at the time? I was seven. Yeah. I believe you recognise as the, the youngest person ever to uh, to appear on a top ten hit. Is that right? A top ten rock record. It yeah. is correct. And I don't think I've been I've been topped yet. Um, I and I think Michael Jackson is the youngest male. God bless him. <laughs> um, to ever be on a pop rock record, number one, I think is what it was, or number two. Um, you want to know how it was? Well, how vivid are your memories of it all? Does oh, it all seem a blur to you now? Very vivid memories. It's 
I think, unlike most people's childhoods, which, you know, there's a snapshot or two here or there, you know, that you carry with you. Mm-hmm. Um, I have... <laughs> I have more than a snapshot, you know. I mean, I've got Ed Sullivan's to remind me. I've got uh, Johnny Carson shows. I've got, you know, I've got more photographs of myself and my family than any one person should have. (laughs) (laughs) And it was such a different kind of childhood that I think um, that my, you know, my memories are probably far more vivid than others because it was so pronounced and it was so... You know, I mean, it was, my childhood memories are nationally covered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, on a whole, it was a wonderful adventure. It truly was. I I mean, it's, you know, it's it's who I am. It's who I've continued to be. And uh, very fortunate, feel very grateful for having had the opportunity. Looking back, how do you think you coped with all the, the attention and fame? Were you overwhelmed by it all at the time? Uh, there was times when I was overwhelmed by it. I think, you know, when I couldn't go out and just be, a lot of times we would play, uh, I don't know, let's say State Fair, and I just wanted to go out and go on the rides in between the shows, and and I'd be followed by like 25 screaming chicks asking me where my brothers were. (laughs) So I, I literally wouldn't go out with them. So I could say, oh, they're over on the (laughs) loop-de-loop. You'll find them over there. And I'd see this scattering of 14-year-old girls running in the opposite direction of me, thinking I was quite clever. (laughs) (laughs) Having having been a child star yourself and and seen the pressures that can can be put on a young person, I guess you can understand how some child stars have have taken a wrong turn in life in later years. Yeah, I can can see that for sure. Um, It's a bit of a... A distorted view possibly of yourself and and um, as you grow older if you know I mean it depends on what you're doing and and your sense of yourself you know that it all comes into play but um, it's kind of like puppies and kittens everybody likes a puppy and a kitten but when it grows up to be a dog and a cat not so much mm. and I think child stars or child entertainers unless they're really truly artists you know what I mean? In, in the in the most truest of sense and can kind of evolve with their age. They can evolve um, artistically as their age evolves. I think they're okay. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, there's a few people who have made it through. But I think, um, you know, if you're a child star and it was mom's idea and it wasn't really yours, eh, I think it's, it's a harder road to, uh, to hoe. Did you have to deal with that problem in later years of people in the industry not being able to come to terms with the fact that you've grown up as a person and, and musically and they still associate you with that little girl from the 60s? You know, personally, I have not. And I, I think it, it has everything to do with that I never stopped making music. Uh, like I said, you know, kind of hearkening to what I was just saying, I... I you know, at 16 years old, I went and got uh, a record deal after the band, the Cowsills, had broken up. Um, you know, my mom wanted me to go back to school where I had never been. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is incredibly unreasonable request of you. <laughs> and uh, she was, well, what do you, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? Just sit around at home and watch TV? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to go get a record deal. I'm going to do what I was taught to do. Yeah. And at 16, I had a, a, a singles deal, they called them, that, in the, back in the day, which means you just make 45. Okay. And I had a record deal on Warner Brothers for a brief time. And then I just kind of always, um, the people who I hung out with were all musicians. They were all musically, you know, I mean, I, some of my best friends were like uh, Jackson Brown and Jules Shear and the smithereens and and just you know really creative and current musical entities and these were my friends so i was i was always making music as i was going along yeah and um i think some of my brothers you know got it in their head occasionally that this was a a strike against to have been the cute little cow sill but i think that's that's all what you make of it you know, if if you just kind of remain in that mindset, well, then yeah, people are going to look at you that way. But I've I've always just moved on, and and I I humbly say I think I've you know gained a certain amount of respect as a as a musician and an artist from my peers, but that has not been a problem for me. 
Now, the group made uh, countless uh, number of television appearances and that at the height of its success. Looking back, do you think there was ever a danger that you were becoming more recognised as a TV phenomenon rather than a, than a band as such? Oh, yes. <laughs> not, not, not even possible, absolutely, that, that that happened. And, you know, TV phenomenon and kind of tailored to what the record company was feeling that, you know, the public wanted to see, which was this clean-cut kind of uh, seven little foys <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of crew. And my brothers, they wanted to be the Rolling Stones. Yeah. You know, this was not what they had in mind for all this team wearing matching lemon yellow trousers and shirts and dancing vaudevillian style. I don't, I don't think that's what my brothers had in mind. <laughs> and I mean, before my mother and I got in the band, the guys, it was a four piece and they were, they were like a little R&B band. So, yeah, I think it definitely got out of the hands of of the muses of of the artistic level and and we became more of a entertainers and a, kind of like a television commodity. Yeah. Nah. It's true that you were the group originally in mind for the the series that became the Partridge family? Oh, yeah. Any we particular reason why why the castles didn't end up being yeah, there was a million particular reasons. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they uh, Screen Gems had created this television show for us and came out to our home and stayed with us for a couple of weeks and kind of, you know, checked us out. And I think by the time, uh, from the inception of the development of the concept for the show, you know, the story about this rock and roll family, oh, wow, this is crazy, mm. to actually, you know, its fruition, which was probably a two years in the, you know, the, the creating of it, we had outgrown our own roles. You know what I mean? I mean, we were older teenagers by now. You know, it was the late 60s. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the older teenagers were, you know, doing drugs and <laughs> on very un Keith Partridge like activity. <laughs> uh, that was part of it. I do know that they, they, they did not want all of us once they observed us because, I mean, uh, being a musician and a songwriter and a singer does not make one an immediate actor or actress. Yeah. You know? And uh, they wanted myself and my brother Barry only. And they they were very adamant about having a well-known female star play the mother. And that, my dad, was just like, nah, not going to happen. So I think we probably lost a, another bundle of cash down the road. But <laughs> perhaps we're spared something in that we were already a TV show. Yeah. yeah. You know, just so I was like, geez, I mean, I couldn't imagine being more visible you know, so I, I firmly believe that everything happens as it is supposed to. Probably so a good, it, probably a good thing in the end. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost 100 percent convinced. <laughs> of, of I mean, I would have. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you're fine. Go continue. I was. I, I would have blown all my money certainly <laughs> by the first three years anyway. So, you yeah, know. Of that string of successes you had in those days, are, are there any of the songs that you're that you're most proud of? Oh, you know, I, I really I think um, Hair was, was particularly one that that I feel um, uh, was really, it was my brother's own even supposed to be doing that song. We recorded Hair for a television show that was uh, with Carl Reiner hosting it, and it was a two-hour show on fashion and the styles and, and the, the sign of the times, musically, fashion, hair, et cetera. And uh, the piece, you know, they had, they thought it would be funny to have the cow sills dressed as hippies singing this song on this show. And we thought it was a fabulously funny idea. And my brothers went in and, rec you know, produced, arranged, and recorded this version of Hair that um, after it was done, it was so cool um, that my brothers brought it to the record company and said, hey, can we release this? And they were like, not on your life. You know, we have this in mind. It's called The Candy Kid, and it's a Christmas song. <laughs> and I think it was the straw for my brother's emotional. It's just like, jeez, and Pete. And, it's a, and I mean, on the early, early Council records, my brothers, though incredible musicians, only the big guys played the instruments. We had studio musicians come in. I never understood it. It's not like we couldn't play. Mm. Um, but it was this time of arrangements that had string sections and, you know, harps and all this stuff, which was, you know, musically where every, the pop music was at at the time. So I'm particularly 
think Hair is great because they played all their instruments, they produced it, they arranged it, and it was one of our biggest hits. Um, but I do love The Rain in the Park and other things because I think it's, 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 um, it's a very telling example of music of, of 1967, you yes. know, and it's, it's beautiful. Beautiful song, it's beautiful sound. So I think those are my two favorites. Was there a period of adjustment for you after the, the, the band or after the group uh, sort of went their separate ways? Uh, you having spending all that time of your childhood in the spotlight, getting adjusting to being out of the spotlight? Um, I think it was less adjusting being out of the spotlight and more adjusting just being uh, away from what I the only thing I'd ever known. Like I said, I mean, when the band broke up, all my brothers were legally of age to you know go get apartments and live their own life. I was not. Yeah. So I was stuck with mom and dad, and they're telling me I'm going to school. Well, I hadn't been to school for a full year since the first grade. And I was in, like, the eighth or ninth grade at the t- eighth grade. Uh, I, that was the big adjustment, just going to, you know, not getting up and packing my stuff and getting on the plane and getting off the plane and going to the hotel and then unpacking and going to the venue and doing my sound check, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like, now I'm getting up, eating breakfast, and getting on a bus with a bunch of people who are talking about last night's episode of Star Trek, and I'm just not relating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't, in turn, you know, didn't know what to do with me, and, you know, kids are kids are like that, you know. They, uh, they thought, I thought I was something else, and I just wanted to be like everybody else. That was not to be. <laughs> <laughs> I had a very short uh, career in education. <laughs> So it was really more adjusting to a different lifestyle as opposed to not being famous or being famous. Sure. I didn't really give a shit. <laughs> oh, oops, sorry. No, you're fine. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I, I could have cared less about being famous. I, I wanted to make music. Yeah. But the fame part, you know, was whatever. Take it or leave it. I had been famous, done that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move forward a few years. The Continental Drifters, how did uh, all that come to be? Oh, my goodness. Well... Let's see, it's probably late 80s in Los Angeles, California, and my best friend Vicki Peterson and I were kind of hanging out together, licking our mutual wounds. Her fiancé had died, and I'd broken up with a very long-term uh, relationship. And we were just kind of looking for something musical to do together. We have a little virtual band called the Psycho Sisters. Of course, we never do anything, but we talk about it a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we were just hanging out, and um, I can't even, almost can't remember the exact... Oh, yes, I can. Also at this time, the Cow Sills, we always get back together about every four years. I mean, you never break up when you're a Cow Sill. You just take a break and then come back. Yeah. And I had been rehearsing with my brothers at a rehearsal studio in the Valley and met Mark Walton, who's the bass player for the Continental Drifters, and uh, he was running this rehearsal studio. And he, Vicky and I were there one day, and he said, yeah, you ought to come out and hear, hear this little band we got. And we went to a club called Raji's and saw the guys. And this was way before Peter Holzapple was in the band. It was a whole different lineup. And we just started sitting in with them and... And then Peter came on the, the scene. He was friends with the drummer for the Drifters, and he really liked the band, too. So he started playing with them. Could you hold on one second? Yeah, sure. Stop it, Daisy. My dog is being a very big pest. Stop. <laughs> okay. So it, we all just kind of started hanging out at this club and, and on Tuesday nights playing together. And slowly but surely, we just, by dint of of showing up every Tuesday, we realized that we had um, inadvertently become a band. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess you look back on those years as, as very important in terms of your development as a songwriter? Oh, without a doubt, I owe every single minute of those years to being in the Continental Drifters, to being around really supportive artists. I, up until that point, had never learned to play an instrument, except for my golden tambourine. <laughs> And um, certainly I'd never even thought about writing a song. I mean, that was what my brothers did, not me. And they were just a group of people. I mean, Peter, Mark, Gary, Eaton, Carlo, and Robert Mache were just incredibly supportive and saying, look, you know, there's no way you can't learn to play an instrument or write a song. You've been doing this long before, you know, we even yeah. thought of it. And... Um, really just felt so comfortable in that environment that it, it was uh, 
it's a very nurturing situation for me to become the artist I guess I was supposed to be. Yeah. Now you mentioned... Do you have my record? Sorry? Do you have my new record? I do. I was just listening to it this afternoon, actually. Fabulous. And loving it. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Now, the castles are, are still a going concern, as you say? Oh, yeah. The castles, I mean, we're just kind of like um, messy. <laughs> we every once in a while you'll see us come up out of the lock and oh my god is that oh there they go again <laughs> um we we always get together and play uh it usually centers around my brother bob writing a, a parcel of songs and we'll all go into the studio make a record we actually made one i guess pretty you know about 11 years ago now uh, but it's it's a great record. It's called Global, and you can get that on um, if you go to um, cowsills dot com. Yep, we have a website, and it's a wonderful record. It's just so good. I highly recommend it for anybody who enjoys a good Fleetwood Mac record or or something of that nature. It's good to see. And I guess it's important to you that also that when when you do play together as the Council still you're not just coming out primarily as a nostalgia act, there is new material coming through. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We've never done the, the nostalgia run. It is just, it's just, I mean, and then there's nothing wrong with it, and people who do it, uh, more power to them. It is just never interest us, yeah. and we always have new stuff. I mean, now, that being said, if we're playing a show, we're certainly going to play Rain the Park or Hair. You know, I mean, we're not, we're not ashamed of it, and we, we love to do it. Yeah. But it's always surrounded by new music. Um, we just actually got together last September in Los Angeles to do a benefit for my oldest brother who's having medical problems. He's got, uh, he's just a mess. He's got uh, osteoporosis and his bones are disintegrating. He had a 12 hour back surgery and he can't play. I mean, all he does is play music and he can't even stand up. So we had a benefit for him in LA and, and <clears throat> Shirley Jones came out. <clears throat> <laughs> to uh, address the crowd at the beginning of the evening, and she was quite fabulous, and basically saying that she felt that they all owed, that she, for herself at least, her, the second round of her career to the Cowsills, and that she felt we never quite got the uh, credit for that that we should. And she came out that night. It was really, really sweet. Oh, that's nice. She's, oh, she's a doll. And um, so we actually recorded that evening, and we're going to put out a live record from it very soon on our website. So it sounds like you've got a comfortable situation there balancing your castle's work and your solo work. I do. I do. And, and the guys know, and they're, they're very, talk about supportive and loving, very, very um, encouraging to me. They just, they think, um, they think I'm the shit and they, they love what I do and, and any, you know, they're very respectful of what I do and if, if I can't make it to a certain thing with them, they're cool about it and they'll work around my schedule. It's really sweet. They're a wonderful batch of boys. <laughs> this new record, it must be a wonderful feeling to have uh, your own album out there after all these years in the business. It really, really is. I, it's something I, I think I spent many years thinking I really had no interest in or would ever do. Uh, people were more concerned with me having a solo career than I was. I think that had probably a lot to do with the fact that I had always been in a band with people, and I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And solo, well, that sounded boring, you know. <laughs> with me, myself, and I, oh, jolly good. <laughs> and in fact, to this day, when I'm on stage doing a show with my band, I get tired of listening to me, and I'll, I'll, because my guys in my new band are all songwriters and singers and it's like god please somebody sing about themselves i'm so over me <laughs> um but that being said you know after the drifters um was over for me uh it was really it was time it was it was time to you know go to my the college of my rock and roll days and and see if i could uh pass <laughs> <laughs> and i i really was, am so proud of this record because you know I'm a, I'm a big fan of Carla Bonoff I don't know if you know who she is yes yeah. um, but she certainly was a lot of inspiration for me as I was coming up as a teenager and I always thought God if, if I ever did write songs or make a record I certainly hope it has the warmth and soul that, that her records have and I, I think I surprised myself when it was all said and done I was like well dang I, I think I did it which is a great feeling, you know, because I waited a long time, and if it had been a bust, <laughs> I certainly would have survived because I've survived many a bust. 
But um, instead, I get to be really, really proud of it and and feel comfortable saying that I, I really think it came out great, you know? And it, it certainly speaks for me uh, about my life and times. And I just hope the next one is good. <laughs> <laughs> If, if there was one particular theme you could place on this record, what would it be? Theme? Yeah. Survival, um, hope and faith, and um, picking and choosing which side of uh, your glass you're on, you know, the half empty, half full. Mm-hmm. And um, I have obviously chosen full. And I also feel that um, on a universal level, you know, this is not just my story. It's everybody's. Everybody's got their own shit, and everybody had whatever in their life, you know, good, bad, and otherwise, and the culmination of of that is who we are today. And I think we all tend to look at each other sometimes like, like we're all some separate entity, and I, I think that's ridiculous because um, human beings are human beings, and we're all, we're all the same. Yeah. And I think that it would benefit, certainly... <laughs> our planet <laughs> if everybody would kind of start realizing that and quit fighting each other so those are the things I think that I get out of it were you pretty sure when you went into the studio what you actually wanted to to, to achieve with this record was there a, a certain sound a, a certain feel that you, you had in mind did, and did it come out exactly how you originally hoped it would be oh, well I'd like to say that I knew exactly what I was doing when I went in <laughs> but uh that would be bullshit. <laughs> My husband, Russ, who was the drummer in the Continental Drifters, he and I, you know, put this whole thing together. And though when being in the Continental Drifters, we, we all produced our own records, but we were not heading it up. It was really more Peter Holzapple and Vicki Peterson. They, they were more producing it and, you know, saying what's going where and no, this is not good. And, you know, all the particulars and the sounds and stuff. And Russ and I were just, you know, yeah, that's cool. That sounds good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Come up with an occasional brilliant idea. And then in this case, it was up to us to make it, you know, to, to pick that sound, to pick that instrument, to pick that arrangement, to pick it all. And the first couple of days, I was scared out of my wits, just thinking I have way bitten off more than I can chew. Mm. <laughs> and then about the third day, I was like, no, I haven't. And, and as far as the direction musically, you know, I had my songs... And, you know, people always say to me, it's like, well, what kind of music do you make? It's like, I don't fucking know. I have no <laughs> clue. You tell me. And in the final analysis, um, I didn't realize, perhaps, because the Continental Drifters were very roots rock, very dry, very um, earth, earthy sounding, real, you know. Um, and and mm, I've got quite a bit of pop in mind. <laughs> And, of course, it stands to reason from my past, but I, I just, I wasn't as conscious of that, that going on while I was doing it. Yeah. You know, and, and, but I think it's a nice balance of the roots kind of, you know, thing with, with, with some, with some pop and, and, and a little bit of country, which, I, <laughs> so going in with intention of direction, nah, <laughs> <laughs> putting down my songs and then it's kind of like uh, painting in a way, you're like, oh, oh, this looks good over here. But, you know, I, I didn't go in going, well, this is going to be blue and this will be red and this will be, you know, yeah. not even in the least. I'd be so full of it if I said I, I was. <laughs> I, maybe I will next time because I, I certainly learned a whole lot. We Russ and I, boy, you know, it, it, yeah. Maybe next time I'll know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's not such a good idea. <laughs> written with with this particular project in mind or there, were there some that uh, you carried with you for a while there were a couple i carried with me for a, a while and and um like uh the song gazebo i wrote that probably about seven eight years ago it was a an ode to the family i think um and uh let's see what else um crazy was written about five years ago and and certainly when I write, I'd love to, uh, project in mind, not even close. I, I, I have nothing in mind. I'm channeling. You know, it's like 
people even say, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, this is very pop and country. It's like, so when you're writing, did you write with that in mind? It's like, I w- I, that would be awesome. <laughs> if, if I could write with anything in mind, well, I would say that I was really, you know, I, I'm most, more or less, I write because my soul knocks on the window of my heart and goes, help me. <laughs> <laughs> I need help. <laughs> so, um... But I, but I did write a bounty of this record knowing I had made a decision to make a record. So now the pressure was on. It's like, okay, start creating, woman. <laughs> <laughs> you, you chose a, a classic Sandy Denny song to cover on the record. And what, what was it about that song that um, made you want to cover it? I mean, indeed, in general, what do you look for in a song? Okay. Um, in particular with the Sandy Denny song, first of all, I'm a huge Fairport Convention fan. And um, and the Drifters often covered a Sandy Denny song live. This one in particular was mentioned to me um, by my guitar player, Chris Knott, that he thought it would be a cool one for me to cover. We did it live, and I really liked it. But I wasn't totally convinced that I, that I should... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, I wrap around a lot of Sandy songs, and, and I really did like it, but I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. wasn't completely convinced and then a very dear friend of mine um who is his mc gainey he's a character actor in in the states in fact he's going to be in the next dukes of hazard movie oh wow (laughs) he plays the um boss hogs (laughs) (laughs) but anyway i was he came to a show one evening and and he stood up and just started bawling at the end of it and begged me just for him to put it on the record and so just for him I did and and I'm really glad I did yeah. I think it came out splendidly the wonderful version of it it's an often covered song but uh, I think you've uh, you've really nailed it there it's fantastic oh thanks that's very sweet of you and if you're touring band and the line up and some of the I background of the people there I can do it um, well we just talked about Chris so we'll start with him <clears throat> he's a guitar player from D.C. But he's been living here in New Orleans for about five years, I think. His name is Chris Knotts, and he's a great guitar player. He's also a fabulous songwriter, and uh, I'm sure one day we'll make... He has uh, several other bands in town that he heads up um, called Flatware, and the other one's called The Plowboys. Um, And I think he needs to make his own Chris Knotts record one day, and he's also a really great singer. He does a lot of the two-part harmonies with me. And, you know, primarily and mostly, like, one of my best friends. And that's kind of the, the deal with all the guys. Um, bass player is, is Rob Savoy. He has had a long and illustrious career. He was in a band called the Blue Runners, which is a Cajun rock band out of Lafayette, Louisiana. That also, Russ Broussard, my husband, ex-Continental Drifter drummer and current drummer for me, also was in the Blue Runners. Uh, and then after that, Rob was in a band called the Cowboy Mouth. And uh, had had enough of that and uh, decided to take a break and start teaching yoga. And he did that for a while, which soothed part of his soul, but he still wanted to make music. And again, just been one of my best friends here in New Orleans for a decade. And uh, he also writes and plays, so we hear from him throughout the show, too, because, like I said, I get pretty tired of me. (laughs) And then, of course, my favorite um, bandmate uh, is my husband, Russ Broussard, and he plays drums. He also co-writes a lot of stuff with me on the record and in general. And uh, he's one, he is just the best drummer ever. If, if, even if I hadn't married him, I would have hired him. <laughs> <laughs> but now I don't have to pay him, so that, that works out. That's a good arrangement, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, a, he's actually a brilliant, he's a brilliant songwriter and doesn't know it. Mm-hmm. He brings me lyrics and, and goes, oh, I don't know what this is. And I'm like, holy cow. So then I just whip him into shape and bring him back to him, and he's like, huh? <laughs> I did that? <laughs> so that's my guys, and that's the touring band as it stands right now because, frankly, there is no money to be made. This is a labor of love till it gets on its feet. Yeah. So when we go out, everybody goes out knowing, you know, whatever we make, we put back into the kitty to be able to go back out again, you know, gas money, van money, whatever. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, also, you know, there's a lot of musicians on my record that will also um, be accompanying us on, on as many gigs as possible. They're also willing to take the hit 
if they can afford it. Like South by Southwest, we're going to have Jansen Lohmeyer, the keyboard player, uh, Johnny Sansone, the harmonica player, uh, hopefully Jean Fishberg, the uh, fiddle player, and it bumps up the show to a whole other notch. It's really fun. <laughs> but they, you know, someday soon, I'm going to get myself a, a deal in the States. We're going to get a big old hit record and uh, take it to the Grammys, and then I'll be able to pay everybody, and we'll uh, be one big traveling jubilee. I like the sound of that. That sounds good. That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> I would assume it'd be safe to say that the, the move... I just believe it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the, the move to New Orleans has uh, influenced you greatly musically? I should think so. I mean, I when I listen to my music, I don't hear it, but I do know... Just breathing the air, the swampy little muggy air out here, just being here, it's such a soulful place yeah. that it is, it's, it's inspiring beyond words. And I suppose there's a little, there's a little Louisiana sound in there, some yep. people say. So yeah, I guess it has. I, I love New Orleans so much. In fact, we just got um, nominated for the Best Roots Rock Band here in town. One of our main music magazines has a award show. Yeah, you know, we have Offbeat and The Gambit, and we got nominated. And I thought that was really cool. Fantastic, Susan. Got to thank you. All we're happy campers over here. And so you should be. It's an exciting time for you. I can, I can yeah, feel it in your voice. Pardon? I can just hear it in your voice. It's obviously yeah, a very exciting I'm, I'm, time. I'm, I am. It's. It's. A, it's. <laughs> you know, my life could have gone several different directions for a number of reasons, and uh, you know, we had a, we had a great childhood. We also had some rough times. We had a, a dad who was a slightly out of control kind of guy, and you know, you can you can turn out like my poor friend Michael Jackson or 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 not. Yeah. And I I again I I, I do think it's a choice you make that you're either gonna step up to the plate and live your own life and make it yours and make it what you want, you know, or or succumb to the to the pressure and, and to the strangeness of, of growing up in a rock band and and perhaps having, you know, family difficulties and but I think that goes for everybody. I don't think it has any you know, I think that's any human. How you start out certainly has everything to do with your upbringing, your parents, your surroundings, but how you end up has everything to do with you. And that's what I believe. Well said. Susan, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute treat to uh, to catch up with you. Uh, I appreciate it more than you know, and I'm, I'm so glad we finally made it here, John. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never. Congratulations yeah. on, a, on an outstanding solo debut. You're a sweetheart, and listen, we're gonna we're gonna get down under soon. I hope. Oh, that'd be great. That'd okay, be great. Thanks, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Take care. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye.